Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming to the first in five uh, events, uh, all collectively known or called Trump uh, Point Counterpoint. This is a course that I am teaching this semester uh, here at Amherst College, and uh, that uh, springs from the sensation that some of us experienced at the end of last year when uh, the presidential election was taking place and uh, it was becoming clearer and clearer as November 8 was approaching that uh, there was a fracture or uh, an abyss between what was happening in the country at large or in certain portions of the country and in small uh, college campuses, some of them not so small, uh, where the visions, the views, the ideas were uh, to a large extent different than the ones that were taking place on, uh, on other parts of the country and in the media. Um, the goal of the course is to bring in opposing views that uh, are shaping our country and enable them to listen to one another in a tolerant, civil, engaged, and uh, respectful way. And as uh, this first event connected with the course uh, starts, I invite us all to uh, engage in the very same spirit, a spirit where we understand that in a large country of 325 or 330 million people, there have to be many different views, and if there is something that is going to keep the country together eh, as we move into the future is the possibility of listening to one another and not always agreeing, but recognizing that the ideas that come on the other side are as valid and as eh, worthy as our own ideas, and that our own ideas are going to be sharper, eh, more polished, uh, they will sit better when they are not in isolation, they are in connection with the, those that are on the other side. The purpose again of the course is to bring opposing views. Uh, one of the intents in organizing or in curating the series was to bring those opposing views sometimes during the very same session, to see them connect with one another but uh, the scheduling uh, challenges that that post were enormous. We are bringing four very distinguished guests from the large uh, stage. And uh, I tried as best as I could to have them, at least two of them from different sides of the aisle, coincide on the same stage. It wasn't easy. And so we have an opportunity to listen to them uh, in, in individually, and uh, for those of us, and I invite you uh, all to join us, for those of us who can follow this, this four events, really five, and I'll show you what the, that fifth is, to be able to see how those views connect with one another. The four guests that we are having, we start with uh, Wesley Lowry, who is a uh, Pulitzer Prize winning journalist for the Washington Post. I will introduce him further in a few minutes. And the author of uh, an astonishing book that the students read in class today, They Can't Kill Us All, The Story of the Struggle for Black Lives. It is a book about the Black Lives Matter. And uh, it was published barely a year ago. The books, uh, this book and others are available outside for purchase and for uh, Wesley Lowry uh, to sign, to autograph, uh, courtesy of the uh, Amherst Books. And I thank Nat very much for uh, the effort of bringing them, bringing them here. We have also Brett Steffens, who writes a regular column, weekly column for the New York Times on the conservative side. And we have William Crystal, who is the editor at large of uh, the Weekly Standard and a regular on CNN and other shows. And we have uh, Robin Wright, who writes about Middle East and uh, women 
and the Arab Spring for the New, York, for the New Yorker. And together with that, we will, we're also going to have an event that instead of taking place at Stern Auditorium, all the, all the uh, ones I just mentioned will take place here, and please uh, note the dates. Uh, they are listed in the posters, and they will be listed on the Amherst College website and on any, any PR. We are also going to have an event at Holden Theater, the small theater next to the admissions office, devoted to immigration, where we have invited members of our town that are dreamers or uh, connected with DACA to tell us their stories uh, so that Amherst can feel a little bit more vividly what it means to be in Amherst. I mean Amherst College in Amherst Town. You are all cordially invited to that as well. Finally, I want to thank two entities. One is the sponsorship by two members of the class of 1970 who recognize that it is important that we don't only hear our own political views, but that we expand our political views on campus. And uh, they are sponsoring the uh, bringing of distinguished guests. And also the NEPR podcast, in contrast, where uh, all of the participants are also uh, being interviewed, and the interviews are going to be uh, airing on NEPR in uh, uh, all, things cons all Things Considered or Morning Edition, and they are going to be posted on the internet. Finally, I want to thank the members of IT for coming and uh, taping this. Um, as I said, Wesley Lowry is uh, one of the most distinguished uh, reporters writing today. He is on staff at the Washington Post. Before that, uh, he, he started at the Los Angeles Times, where he worked for barely a year, and then moved not too far from us to the Boston Globe. Uh, he has been at the Washington Post for uh, four years. Um, he is the author uh, of the book that I mentioned, They Can't Kill Us All, uh, about, about Black Lives Matter. And uh, the gist, the essence of most of what appears in this book uh, started in reporting that he did for the, for the Post and then mutated uh, into this wonderful book that uh, we're going to be referring uh, to throughout the conversation today. The protocol would be this way. We are going to engage in a one-on-one -on -one for about maybe uh, 25 minutes, 30 minutes, and then we will open it to the audience to participate as well. Uh, there is going to be a microphone here on my left, and though I know that we are not a large crowd, we are a good crowd, uh, I uh, urge you to come and deliver what, uh, whatever question or comment you want to deliver in the microphone because we are taping everything and so it will be on record. Uh, Wesley, I want to start with your arrival, I think uh, maybe uh, four or five years ago, uh, three, four years ago, uh, to Ferguson, F Ferguson, Missouri, mm. where uh, you were called to report on the death of uh, Mike Brown. Um, walk us back to that moment. How did it happen? Uh, how big do you think the story was? How similar was it to many other stories of a police shooting that uh, you had participated in? Sure. Well, first of all, uh, thank you all for. Am I on? There we go. Uh, first of all, <coughs> thank you all for, for having me. Here. It's already been a, a great day or so on campus. I've really valued and enjoyed the conversations I've been able to have so far. And I'm really looking forward to kind of having this conversation in this venue with you all as well. And so thank you for being here. Um, and I'm looking forward to this. Um, the, the book that, that I wrote, as well as a lot of the work that I do each day, um, did begin or has been informed initially by my experiences in Ferguson, Missouri. Now, it was three years ago, um, August 9th, uh, it was when Michael Brown was killed in Ferguson, Missouri. At the time, I was a political reporter for the Washington Post. I, I covered politics, I covered Congress. Um, in fact, on the day Michael Brown was killed, I was in Michigan with a congressional candidate uh, working on a profile, you know, nothing that had anything to do with what I write about now. But um, as 
as so happened, because I was traveling already, I had a bag packed. And, and the first day of, um, you know, Michael Brown's killed, there's, there's a massive public outcry, a demand for answers that stretches into the second day and then a third day. And now I, as I've arrived back in DC on Monday morning, my bosses are asking, you know, who can we send to Missouri? We need to send someone to cover this story. Now, I'd been following the story pretty closely in part um, kind of as coincidence that one of the first reporters on the scene after Michael Brown was killed, a local St. Louis reporter, was a dear friend of mine who I'd known for years. And so I was watching um, the story play out via her social media accounts. At the time, it was really her Instagram page. She was posting videos from the scene, videos and interviews she was doing. And I was watching all of them and, and just thinking about, you know, there, there seems to be something's going on here. Clearly, there's been this shooting. The community seems very upset. There, there's something here. Um, and so I would, you know, I'd like the photos or I'd retweet stuff when she tweeted them, but I was largely kind of watching from afar. And then as I got back to DC, when I was asked to go, uh, and so I, on August 11th, got on the airplane and flew to Ferguson, Missouri. Now, in my previous lives, I had covered policing. I would covered um, police shootings as well as just normal shootings um, when I was working for the Boston Globe as well as for the LA Times. I was comfortable kind of in some of these spaces and I had an interest certainly in issues of race but also issues of criminal justice and the legal system. Um, even when I was covering politics, these were some of the things that I would sometimes attempt to cover in addition to the work I was doing. Um, and so even though I was kind of tired from this other trip, I had a desire to go um, and to see what was going on on the ground. I landed in, in Ferguson and uh, as I landed, I, I, got, or I landed in St. Louis and rented a car and drove into Ferguson. And the first place I went was to the press conference. The family of Michael Brown, this is now the third day, was having its first public kind of discussion and press conference about their son's death. And so as I watched, they, you know, I, I got to a small church in St. Louis and I watched as they filed in wearing the first t-shirts with their son's face on them. I watched as Benjamin Crump arrived, a civil rights attorney who I had known from the Trayvon Martin case previously, who had now signed up with this family and he arrived. And I remember sitting watching this with, with other members of the media, many of whom I knew from other stories. Tremaine Lee from MSNBC was there and Goldie Taylor. And, and we're all we're sitting together watching um, this first press conference. And it, it was striking even in that moment that this was a story that felt very familiar. I felt like I'd been in this press conference before. Here was a grieving family saying they needed justice for their son. Here was a civil rights attorney, a literal civil rights attorney who I had known from previous cases here, saying the same things, talking about how this is not an isolated case, this is linked to so many of these others, naming a, a different list of names than perhaps the ones we think of now. Eric Gardner's name was on that list, but Trayvon Martin and Jordan Davis and Kendrick Johnson, that it was a list that was a few years older and missing some of the names we now might include on there. And, and I watched as Michael Brown's grandmother, you know, burst into tears and, and had to be carried out, right? It was this feeling that I'd been in this room before, but that perhaps something might be different here. Or an open question about whether or not something would be different. I left that press conference and I, I drove across town. The NAACP was holding a massive forum that night to address the kind of unrest and the protest to try to provide some answers to the community about what had happened. And when I travel, I, I can be a little logistically spastic. I'm bad with times and directions, and you know and that doesn't work the best all the time for someone whose job it is to travel all <laughs> over the place and go to things that start at specific times. Um, the, however, the I, so I arrive at this church for this NAACP forum, and what I see is that there are 100, maybe 150 people standing in the parking lot. So I in immediately assume that I've screwed this up one way or the other. Either this hasn't even started yet, the doors aren't open, which would be a, a good problem, or it's already over and everyone's leaving and now they're on their way out, right? And so I'm thinking, well, all right, let me park the car real quick. I'll run up. I'll talk to some people, figure out what was said in this meeting. I can sort this out. And so I get out of the car, and I start working my way towards the door. And as I get there, I realize that it's not that the meeting has already ended, nor is it that the meeting hasn't started yet. As I get to the door, someone tells me, oh, no, 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 no. we're already at capacity. There are 600 people inside. This 150 has decided they're going to stand here outside, and they're going to wait for the meeting to be over so that people can come out and tell them what was said inside. 
Now this is August at 4 p.m. in the afternoon. You have 150 people standing out in the asphalt parking lot of a church. Now I'd covered communities previously, and I'd covered this type of community meeting before. I'd been in those rooms oftentimes with the five other regulars who were there and no one else. And then here were hundreds of people not only packing a church at the, even at the idea that there might be some information shared, but an additional hundred who were willing to wait outside and see what happened. It was the first indication to me that this was going to be different. This story was going to be different. Now, on the way to St. Louis, I had, I had asked on social media, hey, look, I'm going to Ferguson, who should I be talking to? This was a story that had played out on social media. There were, there were young activists, uh, really young residents at the time, who had been talking about this story. And I, so I kind of put a shout out and I said, you know, look, who should I be speaking to? Who, who on the ground have you all been following for updates? And, and this one woman, Janetta Elzey, came up time and time again. I was like, you gotta follow her, you gotta talk to her, you gotta. And so we had agreed we would meet up at this NAACP forum, that, I, that we would find each other and, and we would meet up here. And so I found her outside and I said, look, Take me into the city, into Ferguson. Let's go see where the shooting happened, where the unrest has been the last few nights. Give me a tour. And so she gets in the car and we drive back into Ferguson. And I get out of the car. Uh, she's got a, a good friend who lives right near where everything was happening. So she went inside to get some water to hand out to people. And I get out of the car and I start doing some interviews. And what was so fascinating to me was very quickly how so many folks were telling me stories that I almost couldn't believe that, you know, hey, you know, what, what's the relationship with the police like here? And it was stories of, of people spending nights in jail for traffic tickets. It was stories of, of people calling 911 for help and ending up arrested, right? And, and, and it felt that, and I remember writing all these things down and wondering, am I gonna be able to substantiate each of these, these allegations? Or how am I gonna use them? What am I gonna do? And, and as I'm, I'm interviewing uh, a man standing on a sidewalk um, outside of his home, at some point, a tear gas canister lands near us, and he grabs me and moves me out of the way, and that began an all-night event where there was uh, demonstrators who were yelling at the police and the police who were firing tear gas and rubber bullets back at us. It, that was the first night I spent in Ferguson. I, I, that, on that night, I thought I'd be there probably about three days. I thought I'd drop in, I'd write a story, and then maybe work on some big thing for the weekend. Um, and I ended up spending more or less three months living in Ferguson, Missouri, and now I've spent three years covering the topics, um, both the protest movement as well as the debate around policing policy that was born out of Ferguson, Missouri. And so, but I still do think about very often that first night because it, it did set the tone for, for what these last few years have been, and it was clear in those first early moments that this was, this was different. There's a moment early on in your book, uh, Wes, where you describe sitting at a McDonald's and uh, the McDonald's has become the place where all these journalists, uh, reporters are gathering. It is the place where you guys can recharge your phones and, and it is a kind of a newsroom now. And uh, you and the police comes in and the police says you guys have to evacuate this place. The police uh, is, is becoming impatient. You and a colleague say, yes, we're going to do it. Or at first you ask, and then you say, yes, we're going to do it. The police thinks you are uh, doing it too slow, and eventually you yourself are arrested with your, with your uh, colleague. Um, uh, there's another moment in the book where you talk, and this is a book where you have, you have deliberately, it seems to me, not extricated yourself from the story. You have uh, made clear that you are the story too. Um, in, where you talk about growing up uh, the child of mix, a mixed marriage, a, a white a parent and, and, a, and an African-American parent. So I wonder if you can, um, if, if you can explore, reflect uh, together with us how that biracial aspect of your own identity puts you in any position there that where you're going to uh, feel more connected with one side, more connected with the other, and you all of a sudden become part of the story? I think that, it, it, so, so a few things. I mean, so the first is that, yes, you know, so two days into my time in Ferguson, myself and a colleague, Ryan Riley of the Huffington Post, became the first of what would be dozens of journalists to be detained or arrested during the protest in Ferguson and elsewhere. Uh, because we were the first, it was something that stoked a lot of outrage. Um, it was some uh, fellow journalist watched us be arrested. 
Uh, there were real questions about under, what the, under those circumstances why we were being detained at all. Um, and there was an outrage from the press corps um, and, and, from, and from many people. The President of the United States at the time, Barack Obama, addressed it the next day and Eric Holder gave a speech about it. Um, this idea that, that we shouldn't be arresting journalists attempting to report on, on policing and attempting to report on protest. Um, meanwhile, um, you know, you had many protesters and demonstrators who were being arrested as well and that became actually a subplot of a lot of my reporting was trying to hold to account the police for the other arrests that had occurred, um, in many cases, for completely what should be completely protected First Amendment expression. Um, what was interesting is that that arrest did thrust myself and Ryan into this story, into a way that was uncomfortable for both of us. Right, we were now being commentated about by people. Um, pe people who thought we did this on purpose, or people who thought we were milking it, or people who thought we'd sold out, or th that we became these political footballs in this way in a story that was about something much larger and much bigger than us. I, I remember that night as, you know, we were in this jail cell for like 25 minutes and then they realized that th what they did was dumb and they let us go. But the, but we're, you know, filling out all this paperwork and we're in the, in the police department. And I remember one of our chief frustrations for both of us was that we both had big plans for the stories we were going to write that night. Um, and we needed to be doing all these interviews. And here we are in the stupid police station dealing with a stupid thing. Uh, you know, we're on the story, this, this massive, huge story that really matters. And we've been so removed from our ability to do our jobs because of this. But I do think that this was a moment, and when you look at actually the social media tracking of the Ferguson story, August 13th, I'm sorry, August, yes, August 13th, the day we were arrested as well as Antonio French, who was an alderman for um, St. Louis, was arrested that night. There was massive tear gassing that night, and on social media that was one, that was one of the days that Ferguson had its largest impact and it reached far beyond St. Louis because there was this feeling in this moment that while protests had been happening for several days and people had been talking about this for several days, that for a lot of Americans, especially a lot of white Americans, there was this belief that things can't possibly be that bad. The people on the ground are just making it up. These police can't be so crazy or ridiculous. And then there was this moment where there was this feeling of, well, like, okay, if if the police are treating these pretty boy reporters from D.C. this way, maybe all these poor black people are telling the truth. Hmm. And it is a sad commentary, I think, that it required that for people to, to grapple with that. But it did, in fact, bring attention. One of the reasons I grapple with this in the book or even included in the book is because I wanted to be upfront about who I am and about what my experiences were covering this story, right? That I had unquestionably been sucked into this story personally in a way, and that part of my untangling of what happened over the last few years is unquestionably going to be to, to be colored by that experience, right? And so I'd rather give a reader the information about what happened up front than deny that from them and ask, act as if that wasn't a component of it. The, I, I think that this speaks to a broader conversation we're having in journalism and in the media writ large about what, are the role, what is the role of subjectivity as well as what is the role of of identity in what we cover. I think for a long time we've told ourselves that that in an ideal world a journalist is a voice of God. They are removed, they are completely objective and they are completely, and yet what we have underestimated or, or misestimated is, is how, especially because of the monochromatic nature of our newsrooms, how we're baking levels of bias into our coverage as is, right? That, that we all, do see the world in many ways based on our own lived experiences, based on our own, on who we know and what, and, and our own um, sympathies, and and that the goal should be fair coverage, but we can't achieve that fair coverage in a world in which we are unwilling to accept that we have to self-correct ourselves. Right? It is valuable to me to know that I am a young black man going into a situation and knowing what my biases or my experiences might be so that I can challenge myself and interrogate myself as to make sure I am being completely fair. A world in which I go, of course I'm fair, I'm an objective journalist, creates a world in which I'm not actually grappling with myself about, okay, did I handle that fairly or not, and in which many other journalists and reporters are not doing that. I think that there's, um, you know, being the product of an interracial uh, marriage and, and family, I, I think that there's a few things. You know, I operate in this world as a black man. And I, I've seen that way. I receive the I receive the, um, the the cons of that 
um, and experience our nation that way. But I've also I'd spent a lot of time interacting in intimate spaces with white people. Um, and, and so because of that, I do think it at times can allow me to see those people in good faith, even if I believe the things they are saying are prejudiced or, or potentially oppressive. I, I want to I will go back to the to the actual scene uh, that you described and the connection with with the police in that particular moment. And then, of course, in the book, you go to Baltimore and you go to Cleveland and you go to uh, uh, North Carolina. And I, I, the question that I have first, though, is how diverse is the newsroom, particularly the, in the metro area and in the area that deals with <coughs> police uh, uh, policing in the Washington Post? The well, Washington Post is one of the most diverse newsrooms in the nation, but certainly not diverse enough. Um, myself and many colleagues do a lot of work internally to, pref to pressure um, the Washington Post as an institution to be more reflective of the nation in which we live. We, because I believe that if a news outlet cares about accuracy of coverage, then diversity is not just some type of liberal ideal, but rather it is an imperative, right? That to cover a messy, complicated world, you have to have a messy, complicated staff who can who can seize and tell and understand those stories. And does that happen was not only at the level of the reporters and the journalists, but also of the editors and of the higher ups? I think it needs to. I, I think it, it does not to, enough. Huh? I don't think it does enough. I, I certainly don't think it does enough. I think that we this entire industry has a systemic issue with diversity in management and diversity in decision making. Um, and, and because of that, I think it results in a lot of the clumsy coverage we often see of issues as it relates to otherwise underrepresented or misrepresented people groups. It's, it's that we know the things that we know best, which are our own lived experiences. We understand the nuances of our own experiences, of our own church where we went, or our own neighborhood where we grew up, but we might not understand at all the nuances and the, and the intricacies of someone else's, right? And so a newsroom that, is, that becomes composed or comprised of, of one set of people will create very nuanced coverage of one set of people and, and coverage that is lacking in that nuance and understanding of every other set of people. And so I think it's extremely important, especially in decision-making roles, in the assignment editors, in the, in the managing editors, to have people who have a breadth and diversity of experience and, and also have a breadth and, um, and, and diversity of, of friends and families and colleagues. You know, again, so I think that, that's, I think that, that diversity is imperative to achieving coverage that accurately reflects the world. Along those lines, and you and I have talked a little bit about this in the, on the NEPR interview, it is often perceived mistakenly that uh, the, the entire movement of Black Lives Matter and the entire reporting that you have done and others have done has been a white police departments vis-a-vis -a, -vis a black population. But they, it is far more complicated than that. It is often that those police departments are in themselves diverse, and those pulling the triggers can be Latinos or can be blacks. Uh, any further reflection on that part? I think we have to complicate our public conversation about race. I, I think that very often we make a mistake when we frame these conversations specifically about the white police officer who killed the black man, because, because the reality is unarmed black men are killed by black police officers, and unarmed black men are killed by Hispanic police officers and Asian American police officers. That as race intersects with the criminal justice system, it is by and large about structural and systemic inequalities, not about individual prejudices of individual officers, right? And I think that it's just, it becomes a distraction when we, when we have this conversation that is completely framed in the idea of, well, of course this is about race because it was a white officer and a black person, because what that allows people to do is they get to say, well, then Freddie Gray's death wasn't about race at all because most of those officers were black, right? Well. No, because it doesn't matter who the, what the color of the officer is if the policy they are enforcing or the tactic they are using is one that perpetuates or worsens an inequality, right? And I, and I think that we, we have to advance a conversation that is no longer or cannot only be about this idea of, of defining or quantifying personal prejudice as opposed to a conversation that is about defining and dismantling structural prejudice and structural inequality, right? And, and so, and I think that that is much more complicated. It's much easier to say, why doesn't the Ferguson police have any black people, and then they hire three of them. It's much more difficult to say, should the city be getting 60% of its revenue from traffic tickets that, and, and preying on its poor black people, that, that's a much more difficult problem to solve than hiring two people. And, and I think, but that is the root of the inequitable outcome 
That is how race intersects with policing in that city. Mm. And so I think that that, so I just think we have to be willing to have a more, a higher level conversation. Um, that, that yes, the, the existence of a black actor in a, in a situation does not in fact absolve that situation of any racial undertone or, or explicit racial, uh, you know, racial factor. Um, I have heard you speak about uh, the fact that we call upon the policemen to perform all sorts of uh, duties uh, that uh, in truth go far beyond their training. Um, one of them, for instance, is um, dealing with mental illness. Uh, I wonder if you can, if you can reflect in front of this audience uh, on the fact that uh, the police might also not be trained or might be pulled in directions that uh, the American social environment uh, creates and in other societies doesn't have, in that as a result we are also putting certain pressure, uh, not to absolve anybody, certain pressure on the police because of uh, the fact that with a gun they are going to be able to resolve a problem that, uh, much faster than with treatment that will have to uh, entail months and medicine and, and other approaches. I think we have to we have to think about and be willing to complicate what our idea of the role of police in society is, um, and because I think that in order to build the world in which the police play the role that we want them that that I think most people want them to play, we have to have an honest reckoning about what the role the police have historically played in society and what they do contemporarily. Right, I, I think that and and we need to restructure that system to achieve the current desired effect as opposed to just hoping that a previously structured system will figure out how to pivot and do something else, right? If, if the policing system was not constructed with the intention of providing equitable outcomes and protecting and serving all people, then why would we expect that all of a sudden it can? Um, it, it's a structural issue. Now that said, I think that there's a, a real question about how do we resource our police? We spend millions and billions of dollars on policing in the criminal justice system. Um, but is that money being spent in the ways that provide us the outcomes that we want? Now, one of the major projects I worked on at The Post was born out of our Ferguson coverage. It was a project that we ultimately won the Pulitzer Prize for. And, and, and this was born because we, I would do these stories where I would interview all these people in Ferguson. I, it, I would walk around, I'd talk to residents, I'd talk to the activists, I'd talk to, the, to people in their homes. And I'd say, you know, what do you think the problem is here? What do you think needs to change? And, and I would hear over and over and over again that this is a crisis. Black men are being executed in the streets every day. Uh, this has to stop. And then me being a good little reporter, I'd call the police. And I'd say, hey, so everyone says you execute unarmed black people all the time in the streets. What do you say? Uh, do you have a comment? And they'd go, whoa, 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 whoa. We never kill any unarmed black people. This is totally made up. Um, don't you know that most police officers never even draw their weapons? And we definitely don't kill unarmed black people. And if we do, they deserved it anyway. So we don't know what we're talking about. And so I'd write my story, right? Activists say, but the police insist that police shootings are rare. Well, and I remember calling in some of these quotes one day. And one of my editors, a fortunate place to work with good editors, it says, well, which one of these things is true? Either the police are executing unarmed black people in the streets every day, or police shootings are rare and they never happen. Like they can't both be, which thing is true? It's a number, right? And so we set out on this mission to figure out at the time how many unarmed black people were being killed by the police. We just wanted to know. So we call the Ferguson police and they don't, we don't have any answers for you. I don't know what you're talking about. We call the St. Louis police and we don't know, we don't know. All right, so we call the Missouri Secretary of State. How many unarmed black people got killed by the police in, in Missouri last year? Well, they don't keep, this, they don't keep those stats. So we're the Washington Post, and we're like, all right, we're gonna call Eric Holder, and we're gonna march to DOJ, and we'll be like, look, you gotta tell us about all the unarmed black people who been killed by the police. And DOJ was like, look, we have a number, but it's extra inaccurate, please don't use it. If you use it, please quote us saying that it's inaccurate. This number's wrong, it's voluntary. And so we had this moment of realization where we said, look, this is a country that counts everything. We know how many people saw Girls Trip in the theater downtown last weekend, and we know how many of them got popcorn. You know how many barrels of corn there are in Iowa right now, how many cows there are in, in, in Minnesota, right? But we didn't know how many people were being killed by the police. <laughs> Just didn't know? To us, that didn't make sense. Now, this wasn't about how many of these shootings are justified or unjustified or good shootings or bad. It was that we just literally wanted to know the number to rectify this question. 
And so we began researching this, and what we found was that this record keeping was so drastically and remarkably in, in inconsistent that once a year the federal government would call all 19,000 police departments and go, hey, have you killed anybody? And then a f few thousand of them would return the call and they would provide information about some of the people they'd killed, but maybe not all of them. Maybe we forgot about that one that looked a little bad. or we didn't. And, and so what we ended up having was federal data that was largely useless. We had no idea how many people were being killed and were not. So here we had people passionately saying this is happening all the time based on their own lived experiences, and people passionately saying those people are making it up, but without any receipts as to tell us which was true. So my colleagues and I began this database project. Um, what we found was that we couldn't do this via public records because most of these police departments didn't even actually have to tell us if they killed people. But what we noticed was that if someone was killed by the police, specifically if they're shot and killed by the police, if a gun is involved because we have such a focus on gun violence in the United States of America, that at least one time, one reporter would write about it in the biggest media markets in the world and the smallest media markets in the world. In Idaho, if there's an officer involved shooting, that one television reporter would stand at the crime scene tape one day at noon and say, I'm here at the scene of an officer involved shooting. So what my colleagues and I did is we set up this elaborate Google system where every day we searched all these different keywords and we built a spreadsheet of every single fatal shooting we could find that year. In real time, we checked every day. And we began building a database to figure out how many people were being killed, how often was it happening. Now, in those federal numbers, the DOJ said there had never been more than 463 people in a given year shot and killed by American police officers. By four months into the year, we were at 500 in 2015. We ultimately, or five months in, we ultimately ended up with 990 fatal police shootings that year. So more than double the number of police shootings the federal government had ever recorded in a given year. What we saw then, was the theme starting to emerge. That while the, poli the police would insist everyone they killed was armed and terrible, that certainly was not true. There was a significant portion of these shootings that were unarmed people. While it was true that the majority of people being killed were, had a gun. Um, that raises a whole different question about guns and society and how that operates. While we found that the majority and a raw number of people being killed by the police were white people, what we know is that the majority and raw number of people in the United States of America are white people. Um, and that when you started adjusting for populations, you see a, a drastic inequity and disparity in the way black people are being killed by the police. That while black Americans make up 12 to 13 percent of America, they represent a full 24 percent of those killed by the police, shot and killed by the police, and 40 percent of the unarmed people being killed by the police. Um, which divorces any straw man argument about violent crime rates or any of that, any of that stuff. What we also saw, this was the actual question you asked me, was that a quarter to half of the people who are killed were in the midst of some type of mental health crisis. That, that mental health was a, is a major factor in driving the levels of police violence and that if as a society we dealt with our mental health system, that it would lead to a world in which fewer people were being killed. If a quarter to half of the people being killed by the police were diabetics, we would give every police officer insulin. We would solve the problem immediately. And yet, a quarter to half of the people being killed by the police are in the midst of a mental health crisis, and yet many of our police officers still lack the crisis intervention training that is considered the best practice for handling these circumstances and these situations. We have to talk about not just the outcomes, but about the failures structurally within the policing system for us to equip the people who we are asking to come into some of these circumstances. And, and, I, and I, think that that, I think that was a remarkably important element of kind of the coverage that we did. I, um, I don't want to read it, but uh, after your visit to class today uh, and uh, your very thoughtful and provocative uh, interventions, there was a student who wrote me, a, to, who, who sent me an email, I was mentioning this over dinner, uh, who was very impressed with how eloquent you are and how uh, intent you are also in humanizing those that 20% or 25% or 40% that represent those that have, but that you fail, and I, uh, I you know, he uses stronger language, <laughs> you fail to humanize the police, the police officers, whatever background they might have, ethnic, uh, racial, uh, religious, uh, political, uh, in seeing that type of dilemma that are, they are in. 
the argument of the student is, and this is in the spirit of the point sure. counterpoint a, a series that we are presenting here, that there are a series of a conundrums that those police officers are suddenly faced in or pushed into that uh, pose uh, questions of ethics and questions of immediate response and questions that they are not always prepared to in that simply seeing the police shootings as police shootings and turning them into numbers fails to understand the courage and the, and the complexity that they have. No, it doesn't. Um, the, I, I, I'm sympathetic to that, to some of that argument, right? I, I'm sympathetic to this idea that, that it's unquestionably true that we ask the police to do difficult jobs and we often under-resource them and under-equip them to do the jobs that they are in. That we ask individuals to do things that within a system that is broken and, and, and in that, and a system that in fact guarantees these types of inequitable outcomes. And we are placing individuals who are pawns in this thing. But because this is, this is about a system that, that does not work, the individual motivations of, of the individual officers in these shootings does not actually matter. Um, it, it doesn't. Policing policy is divorced from the individual actor. Um, the, the role of police in our society broadly is divorced from the individual officer. But wh why do we care who the reporter is and not who the policeman is? You can buy the policeman's book if you want. I'm talking about my book. You know, like, I mean, I think that, it, you know, I, and I think that that's a, you know, and I wouldn't begrudge an officer who'd like to write a book. Okay. Um, I, I think that the, but, but I think that, and to be clear, my book's not about me. It's, it's about, frankly, it's about the young men and women who took to the streets in protest of what they saw as an epidemic of police violence, right? And so, the, and, and about the, act of covering them, about building relationships and trying to earn trust in those spaces, about the feedback they were giving me about our coverage, right? But I, and so therefore that is the story I have to tell. Um, that is the story that is unique and, and revelatory about the moment that we are in. Um, a narrative about the difficulty of policing, I mean, turn on any channel on TV right now and you can see that. Um, I, I think that the role of of the media and the role of a journalist is, is not to further amplify voices that are already too loud in our society, but rather to, to seek out people who have been attempting to tell their own stories and, have, and who our society has refused to hear. And in fact has said that we're lying. These officers said that these shootings were not happening. They said they weren't killing anyone. And it was a lie. It wasn't true. They said there were no racial disparities. It wasn't true. Going further, uh, Wes, what, what uh, you and I have talked today in a couple of moments about uh, all this happening, all this taking place under Obama. Uh, I think it's a very uh, important uh, issue, uh, the first black president, and we have, we've also been talking about the first white president according to uh, the, way the, the, the attempt by Trump to practically erase uh, most of what Obama has a uh, has accomplished or, or tried to establish. How do you, you've, you've given me a couple of answers here and, mm -hmm. and please do the same and expand as you, as you wish. Why did all this happen in the way it happened? It's not that police brutality didn't happen before, but it was amplified in a particular way during the Obama, uh, particularly during the second term of Obama, why? I think you have a confluence of factors. I mean, I think that, that first, I think first you have a political disenchantment among especially a lot of young black Americans that came from the false promise of the Obama presidency. I think that the writer, my friend Jelani Cobb, said once, and I quote him all the time on this, that we needed to have a black president to understand the limitations of a black presidency. Um, that there was this idea that candidate Obama was rhetorically transformational um, and that his election was in fact historically transformational. However, that the limitation to that transformation was to actually transform the society in which we live, right? That, that President Obama was elected and all of the inequities that existed the day before he was elected existed the day after he was elected. Um, and, and so that the, ex the lived experience for the black American did, did not drastically change and to the extent at which it did not 
changed at all. There was still this I- the idea that that black skin could be a threat or 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 a risk for an American, uh, you know, for a black American. The beyond that, what we saw was the presence of a black president prompted a deeper understanding of the extent to which hmm. so many of the rest of our colleagues in the United States of America um, had a lot of deplorable things they wanted to say about a powerful black person. Um, if we think about what the political dialogue of the, of the Obama years was, it was very thinly veiled racism in most of its attacks on the President of the United States of America. We could no longer pretend as if that was not the world we lived in because we were watching people do say crazy racist things about the president all the time. Uh, and and so I think that there was a, so I think there was a real grapple there. I think that beyond that though, so you have so here you have a, a mobilized core of young Black America who has voted for the first time in either 08 or 2012, who is engaged and hopeful and loyal to a president who is then seeing with their own eyes and seeing in their Facebook feeds and eventually in their Twitter feeds, Trayvon Martin and Troy Davis and Jordan, Edwards, or Jordan Davis, seeing case after case, and it's this reminder of this clear and present danger to black America, that simply saying, well, but the president is black was not enough to, to address what felt like an eminent and ongoing threat. I, I think... This also can't be divorced from the technology of the moment. Black Americans have been saying forever that the police have been harassing them and killing them and assaulting them. And no one was believing those black Americans. Well, now you can watch Walter Scott be shot in the back. Now you can, you can watch Sandra Bland and how she's rudely treated in this interaction. And you can see how that interaction right. goes sideways, right? That it, it took... That this, this wasn't that this conversation was not existing. It was not existing by and large because white people had no reason to have the conversation previously. Now, they're going about their day liking baby pictures on Facebook and, oh my God, you see that guy got shot in the back by the police? That's crazy. I didn't know that stuff happened. There's a whole other population that always knew that was happening and had always been saying it was happening. All right, one last question and then we open it to the, to the audience. Um, at what point did you see, uh, you, you walked us back to Ferguson, and uh, you saw the immensity uh, of what was, uh, what was taking place there. At what point did uh, you see the Black Lives Matter uh, movement shape as an ideology, as a movement? I wonder how you're going to define it. And second part of my question was, is to what extent, now that Trump is in the White House, do we, is this, uh, is this something still present, viable, uh, ongoing, or have we entered a f totally different chapter uh, and are looking at that as past? Uh, are the activists uh, still activists? Uh, do they still have a voice? Or the activists have matured and, and moved to, in, in, maybe to the mainstream or maybe to other subjects? Black Lives Matter, then Black Lives Matter now. Well, I think in my experience, the, the moment, this feeling of protest in different places becoming a united movement was, was as you have the confluence of the anger in the streets meeting and finding an articulate expression of, the, of those politics. And I think that begins to happen in late 2014 and 2015. You have, you have at the time, a drumbeat of what felt like injustices, or what many would argue were injustices. Officers not being charged in Ferguson, the officer not being charged in Eric Gardner's death, the video release of Tamir Rice's death, right? Is November, all is November, December 2014. And you, you see this, this moment where people, where there is this feeling, and now that we are looking for these, these incidents of police violence, we begin seeing them over and over and over again that that became the point at which this was clearly something that was bigger than one city and one set of protests, but rather was something that had legs that were stretching across the country. Now this moment I think is fascinating because I think that for much of the time pre-election, there was a debate, a tactical debate, 
and a rhetorical debate within the activism space about how you interact with electoral politics. There were folks who believed that you meet with the candidates, and you pressure those candidates, and perhaps you even endorse a candidate. Um, perhaps you work within the Democratic Party or, or any other party. And there were other folks who believed unquestionably that that was not something you do, that you agitate from the outside, that you provide pressure. Um, and there were prominent people who made statements along the lines of that, you know, that Hillary Clinton could be, would be just as bad for black people as Donald Trump. I believe that most people in the movement space, those who I've talked to, who I've interviewed, have largely abandoned that stance in light of the election. That not, not that they have abandoned their criticisms of the Democratic Party or their criticisms of the system or structure as is or of Hillary Clinton or Bernie Sanders specifically, but that there's no longer a feeling of inevitability. We have to remember that while I think that the existence of a black president created the conditions for a black protest movement, it also created, it created those conditions within a context of a president who would be sympathetic to that protest movement, a Department of Justice who would investigate police departments. Um, and, I think, that is gone. and I think that for many people, there's been a realization not just that the, the, the investigations will stop happening, but that they will go back and undo the investigations that happened previously. Right. That even things that were considered wins in the past can be imperiled if certain powers enter office. I, I, I'm really fascinated as we approach the midterm elections to see what extent many of the young activists, um, many of these organizations, engage in electoral politics in a way that they certainly did not in 2016. They were involved in the discussion of the issues, but, but, I, but I'm going to be very interested to see to what extent they, they now argue to their memberships and to their supporters that it is imperative to engage in this process, when just a year or two ago they might have argued that it did not matter. Fantastic. We're going to open it to the audience. There is going to be a microphone on this side. Uh, and the reason why we want you to speak to the microphone is because we're taping. Uh, is there anybody who wants to uh, start with the first question? Uh, I, meanwhile, if I don't see anybody, if, if anybody wants to start making uh, your way to the mic, that would... Uh, that, it, it would be really appreciated. It's also that uh, this will be a larger conversation when we have others. I want to ask you an aside while we wait for somebody to come. Uh, you are at the Washington Post, mm -hmm. and uh, the Washington Post is now owned by Amazon, by Jeff Bezos. And uh, uh, I wonder, uh, you and I were talking about this over breakfast in the morning. I think people are going to be very interested on this as well. Um, how much has changed in the newsroom? How, wh what is, what, uh, what's the future of the Post and other printed media when a messianic figure with all the money in the world can come in and say, we can hire as many people as you want, and uh, they can be reporters and they can be well paid? Uh, is this... Uh, are there limits to what you as reporters can say about Amazon or about corporate America? Have we lost some freedom because we have won other freedoms? Anything on that area? So I never worked at the Post prior to Jeff Bezos' purchase. I arrived not long after the purchase um, during a wave of hiring that happened because of his purchase. Um, but when I arrived at the Post, there was still a lot of trepidation about what this would mean. Uh, there was a real loyalty to the Graham family who'd owned us previously. There was this question about what's this Silicon Valley tech guy going to do to us and how, what's this going to look like and does he know how newspapers work and what will his agenda be? Um, and I heard that a lot from my colleagues who, uh, you know, who I was at the time meeting and, and ju you know, just becoming close to. And, and I think that, that those concerns have largely been unfounded. I think that we have, you know, what what our owner uh, Bezos has done, I think, has been provide us with a runway to do work that's important. Saying, oh, what, what level of resource does the Washington Post need to be the best newspaper in the country? And let's provide that resource. Because if we create the best product in the country, then people will pay for the best product in the country. Um, from where I sit, I've seen nothing but expansion, nothing but an uh, attitude of why not do this thing? Why not launch this project? Why not go to this place? Why not tell these stories? I see in the hiring of my colleagues a team of energetic, ambitious people um, who are filling our ranks uh, with stories, with ideas, with, with ambition. 
I think there's always going to be a concern um, about the corporate interest of a media company versus its editorial mission. I don't exist in the space where I would be the one covering Amazon anyway, but I don't know of any example um, in the time that Jeff Bezos has owned us to, of us having any issue, or really, I don't know of any example of him having any input whatsoever in any editorial decision or process. Now, I think that's the ideal. I, 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 now, it's difficult because can the media, media ecosystem exist in a space in which the only way for you to receive quality coverage is for a billionaire to buy a media outlet? That doesn't seem sustainable to scale. Right. Um, there aren't enough philanthropic, um, non-meddling billionaires out there, right? Um, but I, I, I think thus far our experiment has worked pretty well. Uh, and how about a, a, in terms of the packaging? of news and delivering of news. One thing that uh, Amazon loves is for us to have the book before we order it almost, <laughs> uh, or whatever other item it is, and to feel that the customer is always being satisfied. Do you feel that in the way any news, and news that are connected with uh, the field, the, 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 the ground where you are, um, the digital aspects, for instance, will push the the newsroom in a particular direction, that, some, that things have to be delivered faster, that they have to be uh, manufactured in a way that will satisfy the customer more? I think that there's a, um, I think that a mistake that a lot of media companies and certainly newspapers made initially was we resisted the internet, much less mobile phones, much less tablets, That, that we understood how to package things in one way, and that's how we wanted to do this. And that we created journalism for one, for one type of package. And then we bastardized it by just copying and pasting it onto everything else. We would make, even once we came around to the internet, you know, for a long time, we would design something for the newspaper and then make the, and then just put that on the internet without any, any consideration of the user experience going through that, if that was the ideal way to consume that content on that medium. Then, when we figured out that we couldn't just ignore the internet anymore, we did that same thing with mobile, where we'd have a miserable mobile website where it's like, please don't ever click a link on your phone because you're, gonna, you're stuck on the real website in a screen. And I think that one of the things that has been, you know, at least from what I have seen internally, has been a focus on our user experience that, you know, if you are reading the Washington Post on your mobile phone, is this experience optimized? for consuming our journalism on this platform, in this medium. If you're, if you're consuming our, um, our content on a tablet, has it been optimized for this space? I think that we have to respect our readers enough to provide them our important journalism in ways that they can actually, con that it is seamless to consume it. Because we are, because they don't, because what we know is that people don't have to consume our work. We are asking them to, to enter a voluntary relationship. As a reporter, do you read the comments that a story of yours might generate on the feed? Sometimes. And does it affect the way you're going to uh, shape your next story? Rarely. There are times where, you know, look, if someone makes a good point, they make a good point. And, and, and usually, you know, especially in the world we live in now, if, if they note that there is some, some fact that is important that has been excluded, I'll go add that fact. Right? I think we need to live, we live in a world where we are accessible to our readers, and so we need to listen to them. If, if it's important to know this person's age, and I have literally forgotten to put it in the story, you put it in. I'll go put it in the story. Yeah. Any questions, anybody who wants to? Yes, please. Hi. Um, uh, you mentioned um, that um, it doesn't matter what the policeman what the policeman's situation is that the system somehow um, kind of forces, maybe forces the policemen to behave in certain ways and for discrimination to occur. How, how does the system do that, would you say? Well, so, so for example, if you have, if it is the policy of the New York Police Department to engage in a form of broken police, broken windows policing in which they want to be hyper strict about public intoxication, loitering, um, illegal cigarette sales, right? 
and, and they want to do that specifically in certain neighborhoods that they believe to be high crime. Well, that, that is a system that is structured to interact more often with poorer and blacker and browner populations of people, right? And so now you're disparate, because it's not about going where the crime is, right? You know, you, you, could, you could say, we're at NYPD, we're gonna be tough on crime, which means we're gonna have every officer standing on Wall Street all day, every day, right? And we're gonna solve all those crimes. No, you're deciding as a policy, the crime you care about is this one. And that policy is going to force a, a disparate amount of interactions with certain types of people, which then will lead to a disparate amount of whether it be use of force or whether it be. And so there are all types of, just like as a journalist, there are all types of subjective decisions that are made before I even get to the point of writing a story. That, uh, this is a story being the first decision. For the police, long before the officer ever gets out of their car or in their car in the morning, any number of decisions have already been made structurally that will determine the outcomes, right? A world, a, a world in which, um, you know, and this applies to anything, how your, your traffic stop policies, your, your loitering policies, how, how, you, how strictly you are, in, strictly or, or leniently you are enforcing all types of municipal ordinances will determine who is being arrested and who is not, and also where you are enforcing those things. Uh, if you decide, look, if you decide you're gonna enforce uh, loitering laws or, or, or jaywalking laws in Times Square, you'd end up with quite a cross section of people getting arrested. Um, I, I would guess that that's not an enforcement priority of the NYPD, but that there might be some other, other neighborhoods where people are getting their balls busted a little bit for things that had they lived somewhere else would not be. Like, and so I think that's kind of how it, you, you know, I, I think that when you, you think about the, very often I think we make the mistake of when we see an incident Eric Garner, Tamir Rice, or Michael Brown. We want to decide if race played a, fat, a role in this by litigating the personal prejudices of the officer or not of the officer. But, but that, I, I don't believe, is where race enters this equation or enters this conversation, right? The, it, race enters in the aggregate. It, it's that what is the likelihood of this interaction happening because of the policies that we have put into place? And then, divorced from the individual, societally, what are the prejudices that we might be carrying into this interaction? If, I'm more, if we societally have been conditioned by our popular culture or our media and our history to see black men as more violent and threatening, well, then that means in the aggregate our police officers are more likely to do that and therefore, when police officers are empowered to kill people who they see as violent, it will lead to a disparity in who is being killed and who is not. What we did an analysis of on our fatal shootings where we tried to do this thing called threat level where we tried to figure out of all the people being killed, what threat were they actually posing to the officer at the moment in which they were killed. And what we found was that, there, because one of the counter arguments people will say as they jump through all these reasons why race cannot have anything to do with any of this, right? And first, it's because it's violent crime. Well, violent, actually most people killed by the police are not engaging in a violent crime. It has nothing to do, you know, so that it's not particularly relevant. Beyond that, the racial disparities are the largest among unarmed victims. Um, and so, no, there was not a presence of a gun, there was not a presence of a knife, this was not a bank robber or a murderer, this is a guy who maybe just stole some gum. How come in that situation you're killing way more black people than white people? And it opens this door to a conversation about it. As we've had academics come back and analyze our data, they've had such trouble finding any answer beyond implicit bias. That in, placed in these situations, do we as a society view one set of people as more dangerous or violent than another? That would be, Again, that has nothing to do with whether or not the officer is white or black. It has nothing to do with whether or not they are a, a, have a Klan robe in their basement or are leading the Black Lives Matter march next weekend, right? It's about the biases we all carry as a society and then also about, the, again, the kind of the structures and the systems in which those people operate. Just, uh, just uh, yesterday, um, there was, in St. Louis, mm -hmm. it, there's a, there was a story that uh, as uh, the police officers were arresting some uh, protest protesters, they were chanting, the police was chanting, these are our streets, or something to that effect. Um, the, I saw that coverage that initially was reported by Dave Carson as a photographer at the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, who I know really right. well. Um, I do think that a lot of the demonstrations and the protests we've seen have been about a fundamental grapple between 
something as simple as whose streets are these streets? Who do they belong to? Are these streets that are owned and operated by the government and the power um, to regulate and to control through, at times, violence, populations of people? Or are these streets that are owned by these people, the taxpayers, by, by the folks who live here? To what, to what extent does a population have the right and the power to stand up to its government and say, we don't like what you are doing, do something different? But it seems to me, Wes, that the, going back to something you said before, here we have police officers that are becoming individuals and are becoming activists and are taking a stand and are chanting in a way that it breaks. I mean, I, I, I'm from Mexico and I, I, uh, the police force in Mexico is uh, very corrupt and, and uh, very violent. And uh, every so often when I was living in Mexico, I would wonder, what if I stopped and asked that this policeman if he thought that he was doing something good for the country by whatever, responding to the order. So here you have a, a group of policemen who are actually chanting. Does it trouble you? I, I think that I'm torn on whether or not to trouble me it would have to surprise me, um, which does not. Um, I, I think that it it clearly represents and is indicative of the extent to which we have polarized the politics of policing mm. and we have told the population of people that they are besieged and there is a war on them, that the world is, da is so hyper dangerous for them that it has divorced them from this ideal about this being a job that is about protecting and serving people. And this is obviously not true in each, and again, this is something that's true in the aggregate, but it's not true in individual circumstances, which is why I don't think the individual circumstances matter. I mean, I could find you a, a cop from St. Louis who's, who, who's, who believes he needs to be protecting and serving. A great profile of him would, do, would speak nothing to, the, to the, uh, the chanting that happened last night. Mm. In fact, it would serve as a distraction from this, this belief clearly being expressed by his colleagues. The, I, I think that that, you know, I, I think that there, again, it doesn't surprise me um, that we've seen open hostility from law enforcement to calls for reform as well as to, to these demonstrations and protests. Seeing nobody else here, uh, yes, please. Oh. And there's another one here, right here. Oh, I didn't mean to cut. Please, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Okay. Um, you had said that you couldn't find accurate statistics from um, government sources. Um, there must be police reports filed. They're just not reported, or statistics aren't uh, taken from those police reports. Is that? In some, I mean, there are nineteen thousand police departments in the United right. States of America. Um, there are some whole states where they don't have to give you, where the police don't have to give you any records if you're not a state resident, right? So, call the Memphis police. They do not have to tell you how many people they've killed. You don't live in Tennessee. Um, the you you have. Um, there are, there are large and broad public records exceptions for active investigations. When the police kill someone, very often that takes years for them to conclude their investigation, which means there's no access to any information about what happened in these it's cases. It's just not accessible, yeah. Correct, uh, beyond that, these are reports written by the people who killed the other people. Um, and, and so there's also a question of veracity. And protecting. Um, it, well, you mean that, that this is what this, it, it is a report by the police about a police action, right? Um, and so there is some question of that. But again, the, the federal government has no power to compel any police department to provide any information about anything they do. These, this is the way our federalist system works. They do, the, the police do not have to tell you. They might have to tell the people who live where they live, maybe, depending on where you are. But, that's, but in ag so in aggregate, that doesn't work, right? Because there are enough places where they just won't tell you. The police hold a monopoly on the information about what the police do. Um, and so, sh and so, so that I think has been a, you know, so much of my work has been not about theorizing, but rather about collecting and compiling data and then running analysis of that data. Right. So what I was going to ask, um, as the second part of that, um, they no longer have a monopoly in a way if you're collecting an alternative database. So what, what do the police departments and our government need to do with that information that they have now, um, to improve policing so that incidents like this 
can be reduced, you know, because there's a lot of, in, in what I've seen, there has been a lot of denial of a problem within police um, responses. See, so I, I think that the creation of data compositors, it high, allows us to do a level of analysis that can more definitively state what problems are and therefore can, can apply policy solutions. That said, again, especially because of the decentralized way in which we police this nation, you have to convince 19,000 police chiefs and sheriffs that your liberal media analysis thing, that these numbers and these professors and these people who think they know things about the world are right and they know more than you, the sheriff, about how you should police in the place you live. Um, in the 70s, the New York Police Department banned their officers from shooting at moving vehicles. What they, 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 it, this was happening all the time. They were getting in these chases with suspects. They would open fire at the car. They'd accidentally shoot the kids who were hopscotching or they'd shoot up the apartment building. They would shoot each other because they were both shooting at a car that was moving and then the car wasn't there anymore and they shot each other. And so they said, hey, this is really dumb. If someone's driving away, we should not just unload a, a clip at that car. We should just follow them in our car. And the New York Police Department saw a radical decrease in the number of people they killed. They invented a best practice. Don't shoot at moving vehicles. Most police departments in the United States of America today, decades later, have no policy banning their officers from shooting at moving vehicles. We see dozens of fatal shootings every single year of officers shooting into moving vehicles. And many of those cases are, are among some of the most sympathetic cases of people who clearly should not have been killed in this situation. Because of the decentralized nature of policing, you can, you have, we have to learn the same lessons 19,000 times. And often, they, those lessons have to be learned by people who actively do not want to learn those lessons. I think that becomes a difficulty of this. I, I mean, I do think that creating this data and running these analysis of the data helps, but it's not as if we are surfacing some solutions that policing has not known about for years. Don't shoot at moving vehicles train your officers to deal with people in the midst of mental health crises, right? Like the, the, these are change the way you train for, um, for dealing with people who might be armed with a knife or an edged weapon as opposed to a gun, right? These are things that, that policing think tanks that policing researchers have identified for decades. It's that you have to convince an entire industry to retrain itself. And that industry thinks you all hate cops and <laughs> doesn't want to do it. One last question. I'm curious, do you think it would ever be possible to convict a police officer of murder? And what could it possibly take by way of evidence that we haven't already seen is not sufficient? Um, it is very, I mean, statistically, it's almost impossible. I mean, we know, we know that. Um, it is, I mean, it certainly has happened. Um, very rarely for an on-duty shooting. I mean, there's, there are plenty of officers who have just been convicted of murdering their wives or their, you know, whomever. Um, the system as currently constructed is, is not meant for the charging and conviction of police officers. We, in the social contract we have entered with our police officers, we grant them the latitude to kill people if they get scared. And we have structured our case law and our court precedents around that. It is legal for the police to kill you if they can convince a judge or a jury they were scared. No other questions, are, there's, there's no other consideration largely. I think that there would have to be possibly the, the creation of an additional or a different charge that might apply to officers. I think there could be there could be a world in which I think there I, I think short of that I don't know that there's a world where we ever see the frequency of charging and so therefore or the frequency of conviction which I think also raises a question of whether or not under our system as constructed, the conviction of police officers is even something that is a reasonable goal um, or if justice looks like something else. Um, again, that being about the reality of the structure, not about what is right and wrong and what should happen or should not happen. Um, and beyond that, we live in a society where we are all largely sympathetic to the police. We don't want to be police ourselves. We believe they have difficult jobs. We understand they're placed in difficult situations. And there are cases of juries saying, we definitely think this person should not have killed that person, but we're not sending a cop to jail. That we have a cultural and societal 
impediment to the conviction of police officers, in addition to a structural impediment that largely prevents it from even being able to happen. And so I, I'm not particularly confident that there's a specific change that, that would begin facilitating that. I actually don't know that this is a system that's constructed to ever be able to do that. Well, we've reached the, the end, and, I, and before we say goodbye, I, I want to thank you for the, for the really riveting, extraordinary, incredibly informative, and the uh, uh, presentation uh, responses that you've given us throughout the day, certainly I, uh, to me, uh, with the students uh, in the NPR interview and now. And uh, I want to remind everybody that uh, Wes's book is outside, available for purchase and for signing. And I want to ask you one more question uh, to give you a chance to uh, wrap things up in whatever way you want. And it's actually not in the form of a question. It's in the form of a word, and it's a rather short but explosive word, Trump. What about him? Um, I think that it's a remarkable time for all of us. And one of the things I'll say as a journalist, as a reporter, as someone who writes and, and tries to explain the world in which we live, few things create clarity as much as crisis. And I think that in this moment, it is as important as ever that we are probing and asking questions, that we are taking account of things that are happening. I think, in fact, in moments of relative helplessness or in moments where there is a lack of expectation of justice, it's more important than ever to quantify perceived injustices. During the last administration, there was a belief among, I think, a lot of reporters who write about what I write about, that if I find the right case, that, that we could change the, the reality in which we lived in. That if I find the right case, this department will embrace this reform. Or if we tell this story the right way, it'll prompt an investigation that will lead to a reform. There's no pretense whatsoever that that's what's going to happen now. But I think it's, but I, that I actually think that makes this job more important as opposed to less important. It's easy to do a job when you think that you can change everything. It's much more difficult to do a job when you actually think no one's going to read it, no one's going to care. But I think also to the tradition specifically of black journalists and black journalism. I think about Ida B. Wells um, and her coverage of lynchings in the United States of America. And I, and I have trouble believing that on a single morning, Ida B. Wells woke up and thought, today I'm going to chronicle this lynching and then the white people are going to go, it's crazy that we did this thing. We should never do that again. Did you read the article? That was really fucked up, that thing we did. She knew that she was writing things down so that decades and generations later we would know what happened. Right. And that we could now be armed with this information as to properly historically hold people to account as well as to say this is something we never want to allow to happen again. I think this is a space that a lot of us operate in this moment where, where we need to chronicle the unweaving of what is happening to parts of our democracy. But we also have to continue writing down the stories of black people and brown people. Not only if we think we can change things, but I think especially if we think we cannot. Um, and so that's something that I try to think about as I decide what work I'm doing and how I'm doing that work. Is that, you know, is this a story that would otherwise go untold? because people think, well, we can't change anything. And if that is the case, then that's a story we definitely should tell. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.